Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new. Song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. His holy name, sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Your rich in love and Your slow to anger, Your name. Worship your heart. 
slowing down At the cross, at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you Where your love ran red And my sin washed white
Principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be both Lord of the dead and of the living. We brought nothing into this world and we take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The eternal God is our refuge. 
and underneath are his everlasting arms. We welcome you to this service of thanksgiving for the life of Valerie Alicia Ford. At this point in time, I would wish to express appreciation on the behalf of this family for your presence here, supporting them in the hour of bereavement. In our leaflets, we have a beautiful song, Love Divine, All Love Excelling. This will be our opening song. and glory. We remember before you this day our sister. We thank you for giving her to us, her family, 
and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gates of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until, by your call, we are reunited with those who have gone before us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to now have the first reading and Bible lesson taken from St. John chapter 14, 1 to 6 and verse 27, read to us by Ronaldo Prescott. Good afternoon. The first Bible reading is taken from John chapter 14, verse 1 to 6, and it reads, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there he may be also. And whether I go, he know, and the way he know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not where thou goest, and how we know the way. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Here ends the reading. Thank you. We'll now have the eulogy. It will be read by Roger. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and family, good afternoon. Today, we are gathered here to bid farewell and to celebrate the remarkable life of Valerie Alicia Ford a person who have touched many lives in countless ways. It is with heavy hearts that we mourn her passing, but it's also an opportunity for us to honor her memory and the legacy she have left behind. Before I go any further, let me introduce myself. My name is Roger Williams, a Sergeant of Police within the Barbados Police Service and a member of the Police Cricket Division 1 team a very good colleague and friend of Larry Bab, Valerie's youngest son. I've known Larry for 15 years, and during this time, his mother was pretty much a part of our conversations, and even so, most recent. It is with sadness that I read this eulogy on behalf of Larry and the family. Valerie was born on the 2nd of May, 1957, to Alda Ford and Ray and Fred Lashley. She was one of 10 children and spent her many years between Crab Hill and Coles Cave, St. Lucie. She had three children, Quincy Ford, Lisa, and Larry Bab, and seven grandchildren, whom she had a heavy hand in raising. From all reports, Valerie was an extraordinary individual filled with compassion and kindness. She was very helpful to everyone around her and would oftentimes go out of her way to please someone or make them comfortable. When Valerie was not doing NCC's work, she was busy cooking, cleaning, washing, or pressing, usually for her family, but very often for others outside of her household. Valerie lived her life with purpose. That purpose was for her children and grandchildren. Quincy, her eldest, was always around. He and his mother used to sit and talk about any and everything. When she did not see him, she would go searching for him. Valerie liked to have him around, and up to the time of her sickness, Valerie still washed and pressed for him daily, even though he told her it was no longer 
her responsibility. She said, my son must go to work clean and sharp. His children, Ebony, Jamali, Marcus, were very close to her and spent most of their time in Crop Hill, St. Lucie. His last son, Ezekiel, got to know her through many vacations which were spent with the family. Lisa, her only girl, they lived like typical mother and daughter, making sure that the home was always in order, taking care of business. Valerie was always busy doing something, and regularly, Lisa would answer just to relax. She was very particular with what she ate, and she used to say, no one can cook for her, not even Lisa. So everyone had to wait until she got home from work so that meals could be prepared and everyone could share. Of course, as she got older, she was expected to slow down. But her children did not think she knew how to. In the end, though, she had to choose to eat whatever Lisa had prepared. Lisa's daughter, Sharika, was Valerie's spuga. She lacked nothing, not if Valerie knew what she wanted or needed. If she heard that Sharika needed a computer, she was heading to courts. Her spuga must have it. If she needed something from school, Valerie would not hesitate to get it. She did her best to be responsible and a vigilant grandmother. Larry, my friend, was her last son and child. I dare say her favorite. Everything was my Larry. She was his biggest cheerleader. She felt every high and low of his life. I was quick to tell him, don't let no one unfear you. I will take care of you. Valerie spoiled her children, even in adulthood. She was at the hospital for the birth of his first son, Brennan, which, he loved, which she loved dearly. She was at his christening and all three of his birthdays and knew everything that was going on with him. In her last days, she would ask, where is my Brennan? Where is my grand boy? Larry's long-term partner, Latoya, lived with the family for many years. She said that Valerie embraced her and her daughter, Raina, as members of the family. They spent a lot of time together talking about life, arguing to, agreeing to disagree on many things. Valerie's, Valerie had her back in many ways, and you can use your imagination. Brennan's time with her grandmother was, was sharp and limited, but his parents say, they, he was like her in many ways. For example, if he is inside and hears noise outside, he would stop whatever he's doing and go outside to see what is happening. Nothing gets past him. They would often say, you are just like your grandmother. Today, we remember Valerie for her unwavering dedication to her family and friends. She cherished her loved ones especially her siblings, and her love knew no boundaries. She was always there to lend a listening ear, offer a helping hand, or provide words of encouragement to a friend. Her children used to think that she was wearing a tracker. Most days, as soon as she stepped through the door, the phone would ring. It would either be Forlene, Abraham, Miss Harris, Patsy, or Bowden. Every morning at five, the phone would ring. One of them again. They were like her alarm clock. Valerie's passion for life was evident in everything she did. She was a hard worker, and she was determined, and she was good. As long as she could get out of bed, she would go to work. So when her doctor and children advised her against working, it was as if she was gasping for air. She did not know how to live without working. Beyond her personal accomplishments as mother, grandmother, and friend, Valerie 
was a pillar of her community. She devoted herself to make a positive impact, whether through volunteering, supporting various causes. She was committed to the development of the North Stars Cricket Club, spending countless hours cleaning and making sure the club was ready for any event. She believed in people and worked tirelessly to help them. She also spent a few years working at Dee's Bar on weekends before she was forced to stop. Valerie seemed to know that she was transitioning. She told her cousin, Vina, I have done what I have done on earth. It is time for me to go. To others, she dropped a few statements which left them sad and concerned. In her last days, her family and friends tried to be there for her. Special mention to Keisha, Keila, her nieces, Judith also came daily to spend time with her. Also Sylvia, Sylvia and Rosaline, sorry, who fed her. And also her nephew, Sean, who put himself on standby for any emergencies. In her journey through life, Valerie faced many challenges and hardships, as we all do. But she approached these obstacles with courage, resilience, and unwavering spirit. Her ability to find strength in adversity and to rise above the challenges is truly inspiring. She taught us through the life many struggles that they do not define us, but rather it is how we respond to them that shape our character. Today, we say our final goodbyes but let us remember Valerie not with sorrow, but with gratitude for the time we have spent with her. Let us cherish those moments, the laughter, the love that she has brought to our lives. Although she may no longer be physically present, her spirit will forever live in our hearts. Let us honor Valerie's memory by embracing the qualities she embodied. Let us be kind to one another extend a helping hand to those in need, and find joy in the simple pleasures of life. Let us carry forward the, the legacy of love, compassion, resilience, knowing that by doing so, we keep her spirit alive. We bid farewell to Valerie, but we do so knowing that her impact on our lives will never fade. She has left an indelible mark on our hearts, and her memory will forever guide and inspire us. As we navigate through the journey of life, we will carry her love and her teachings with us, and we will be forever grateful for the privilege of having known her. Rest in peace, dear Valerie. May your soul find eternal peace, and may your spirit continue to shine bright in us all. Thank you. We now invite you, the audience sitting, to stand with us as we sing that beautiful hymn, And Can It Be? After the scene of this hymn, we will have the second Bible lesson read by Leslie Prescott, Revelation 21, verse 1 through 7. And Can It Be?
seated as the second lesson is being read. Good afternoon, church. The second Bible lesson is being read from Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 to 7. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Here ended the second reading. Thank you. For the acknowledgement of the Barbados Police Service, I'm sure the family of Valerie we're much pleased to have seen you in this setting as a source of encouragement, not only to Larry, but to all the other family members. And I also take this moment to express appreciation for our parish representative in the person of Mr. Peter Phillips, who is seated with us at this occasion. These colors cannot be missed. There are very much acknowledged, the yellow and blue. Happy to have you seated here supporting the Ford family. Now we have a tribute coming. The family will designate the bearer of this tribute. Would we have this tribute at this time? We have any verification? If not, we will proceed. I would welcome you to stand as I read God's word. So, would the sitting audience please stand? Words taken. From the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, 
and the 19th verse. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. The scriptural passage just read was taken from the Old Testament book, Deuteronomy. And Moses, the leader of this great company of God's people coming out from slavery under the strong taskmaster's hand of the Pharaoh, is beginning to sense some measure of freedom. But you know, history has said to us that when the slaves got their freedom, they did some very, very strange things. For instance, those who are around the plantation begin to roll the barrels of the syrup and molasses down to the pond and as though that was the best expression they could have found. What sense would they have made rolling molasses and syrup into a pond? We're not going to bathe in syrup. But people do strange things when they experience some measure of freedom. I don't know what happens with the one who is incarcerated and is released, and they come out. Some people throw a party. Moses is saying to this people, some three million of them, take heed. And may I say to you, the sitting audience here with us this evening, it is what we have learned after we know it all that really counts. It's what we have learned. Before them, there were words of wisdom. I have set before thee life and death. And I like the order because we are living before we die. And he also puts another perspective that demands and deserves our attention. Choose life. Does that make sense? Choose life. And he shows us the choice we make impacts not only us, but those who comes after us, our descendants. That both you and your descendants may live. There must be continuity. And if we're going to have posterity, we want them not only to live, but to live well. Yeah? You remember that song by the Colonel who said, children go to school and learn well? If you don't, you know the balance of what he said. And no doubt many are going through the trolls and the, the troubles of not having learned well. I take you though into the New Testament. Jesus is the speaker here. It's in John chapter 11. And just rewinding the tape a little bit to say to you that my theme for this evening is overcoming the fear of death. No matter who we are, whenever the throbs of death is in our throat, there is a different feeling. Jesus said, St. John 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So we admonish Moses right in choose life, but Jesus is saying, even when you die, if you have a relationship with your heavenly father and with me, you will live again. I've looked at scripture and I've examined this and I am bringing it to you this evening as my seated audience. The Bible describes death at three levels. This evening we are here because one of the levels of death has taken Valerie away, not only from home and family, but from the wider society that she served while she was alive. Physical death really brings separation. As good as we are in our family settings this evening, there is a grave separation between the late Valerie and the other members of that family. There's a great separation. She can't come to you, and as, as time progresses, you will go where she will go, to the Garden of the Dead. The soul and the spirit leaves the body, and all that we would say this evening, she wouldn't hear a word. Because when she died, her very thoughts perished at the time of death. There's no recalling. She has no memory, and the grave does not have any either. The Bible tells us when a man dies, his thoughts perish. So there's no compensation with the dead. If you come to the casket when it's open and you begin to talk to Valerie, it's wasted words. She cannot relate. No thoughts. There's no life. We can conversate and relate if we are alive. If we are not alive, we can. That's physical death. And if you live long enough, that will happen to you. It will happen to me. But then the Bible speaks about another level of death. It's called spiritual death. This is human existence, like many of us are today. But we don't have any real deep fellowship with God. We forget that in him we live and move and have our being. We exercise our rights to our jobs, our commitments to service, Gaturity follows, we say. So we are fearful at the level of human existence. But God, our creator, when he made us, male and female, there was a bond that he placed with us. That's why in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve met with their creator in the cool of the day and he communed with them. They were supposed to be responsible for what's happening in Eden. So says scripture, God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. He had given him responsibilities. So periodically, God would visit the garden, not to see how it was dressed, but to speak with those who were the dressers of it, Adam and Eve. They fail because they listen to the wrong source, and sometimes in life we fail because we too are badly advised. And so we heard words like these penned in scripture, holy writ for our own reading and counsel. We were born in sin, coming out from the race of Adam, and we were shaped in iniquity. And verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. So it's not about goody-goody. This life is not about Mr. Goody-goody. We need a savior. 
and God sent his son. First Adam failed, second Adam, Jesus Christ came, and what he did? He redeemed us from the curse which we inherited from our forbearance. Romans 5, 8 said this clearly, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's one of the greatest programs that people could promote, the plan of redemption. Jesus bringing us back in relationship with our Father, even though our parents were driven from the garden, it was amazing that God had a plan of redemption. Spiritual death speaks to that separation where we can physically exist, but we still do not give credence to divine guidance. Many of us will still say, this is my life, I live it as I please. Remembering, if you can, that man that is born of a woman has but a short time to live, and whether he lives 100 years or not, it is still short, because eternity is very long. People die longer than they live. Check the graveyard and look at the tombstones, and you see people were there from 17 this, and you weren't around. We die longer than we live. We're reminded then that we have a common adversary. And the word tells us in John 10.10, 10, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The future that God has procured for us at Calvary, trust me folks, the adversary of our souls wants us to ditch it. So that men and women live only for what mortal hands can grab, whether it's material, money, or mastery. But then, guess what? If you had a good look in the casket, there's nothing that Valerie could take from her home with her. All that you see there was placed on her. She didn't choose, even as she said, give me blue, you had a choice to give her pink. She had no choice except honoring word. Her separation from her family and her community and all of those who she worked with will leave an aching void. When all the dust is settled this evening and we go over the hill and her body is laid to rest, those who return to that home in Harrison's will see a space that is missing that cannot be replaced by anything. She will be no longer at that address. Separated from her families. One thing I have learned from scripture that believers in God who have accepted Jesus as Lord and master of their lives, will never be separated from God. Did you hear the liturgy in the reading, the liturgy? Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Did you understand that? If you do, say amen. So that death with an element of fear of separation does not reach that level of relationship to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that enables us as we live daily not to walk around with the spirit of fear in our bosom because eventually we are gonna die because the sentence of death has been passed on all men. And no matter what you give for the extending of your life to medical, whatever, by your payments and by your ability to do this or that, when it's all said and done, you will die. The sentence is on every human being. 
I've noticed something that goes beyond what was seen and what we observe here this evening. The psalmist made some profound statements as you read the 23rd Psalm. This is what he said. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow, I like the implant of the word shadow, because he puts a spin on it that we don't think much of. Death is not a destination. He is telling us in death is really a journey. Have you been dealing with people before they cross the bridge? Some people come to a place to say to you, I'm tired. I'm leaving. They have come to ask the fact that they're not going to be around much longer. Yeah? I've been with many. In fact, I would say to you, I would say to you that I have had the opportunity to sing songs for persons who were dying, and I've had the opportunity to close their eyes after death. But I can tell you this, many of them knew that they were dying, and they knew the God in whom they trusted. And God, if you're following the 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley, of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for thou. So tell me, are you sensing that God looks out for those who are passing the veil of life into the death realm and he makes sure that they're not lonely? I am with thee. That's the word. I am with thee. And Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled because, you see, you are going to have to cross the veil of death, leaving life. But he said, through that crossing, I am going to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you will be also. So I, I can now understand why it is called the shadow of death, because Indeed, the reality of dying is frightening without the relationship with God. Because you're going to reckon with the judge of all the earth, and indeed, in truth, we will give account for the time we had here while we were on earth. What is clear to me when I read this psalm is that that valley that we go through before we die it's a process that leads us to a brighter path ahead. And one writer penned it beautifully in the song. He said, cares all pass. Home at last, not sometimes ever to rejoice. Cares all pass. And we have to live with the understanding that this carefree life will one day become a carefree life because we have made Jesus our portion. Yes? So death is not a place we go to, but a place we go through as we come into what God has in his blessed provisions for those who love and serve him. Something back, a gentleman was on his way from his doctor and on his way home, he said he saw some men dressed in black and they were coming for him. Strange statement, isn't it? People in the car didn't see anybody dressed in black nor white. But he said he saw some men dressed in black and they were coming for him. Now, I spoke to that gentleman in the morning about 8 o'clock. I asked him, how are you doing? He said he's doing reasonably well. Now by six in the evening he was dead. Are you hearing me? By six in the evening he was dead. 
He had seen his doctor. He was on his way home. He saw men dressed in black that nobody saw, and they were coming for him. And by evening, he was dead. Saints of God, the angels have an assignment for the saints of God in their dying moments. The angels will bear us to our destination, not men dressed in black. The angels of the Lord encamps round about us, and he is our deliverer from death, even while we go through the valley of the shadow of death. So he saw men in black, but the saints of God will see angels who will take them to their destination. This evening, I need to declare in this setting that the prince of death, Satan himself, has been defeated. It was Jesus who said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys. Keys symbolizes the badge of authority. I have the keys of death and hell. So when the saint dies, the angels will bear him to his resting place. Did you read the biblical story that spoke about the rich man and the poor man and how the angels bore that poor man to his destination? God doesn't leave us stupid. He gives us insights into the word to guide us in this veil called life because we're going to live life and one day we're going to die but he wants us to say whether we live or whether we die we are the Lord's now let's get to the third category we dealt with physical death separation of soul and body spiritual death we are living and walking and doing things but we don't ask God nor consult God about guidance we do it as we say in the Frank Sinatra piece, I did it my way. Revelation 20, 13 to 15, has something to say about the third description of death. And this one, it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up, and dead and develop the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to his works not finished yet and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death no so we talk about physical death we talk about spiritual death but of the three may i say to you seated here this evening you see that last one i'm dealing with now called the second death they have no power they will not come up in the first resurrection. And that is why we admonish as we live. This second death category will be banished from the presence of God forever and ever. Nothing prestigious that you glory in now will change that. It's biblically sound. And if God said it, you better believe it. If you are caught by your carelessness, conducting a life that does not bring glory to God. You belong in the future to the second death. You will be banished eternally from God. So when the books of heaven are open and their names are not written there, the writer who penned that song, is my name written there? In that book, so bright and fair. Hmm? It's the book of the kingdom. Not about pensions and maturity. It's the book of the kingdom. And if your name is not written there, the word said, and these will go away into everlasting punishment. So if you mark the savior, if you miss out on your opportunity of salvation, you have no hope of heaven. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. So then, in this life, 
we will come to a realization that we all have that which we cannot keep. I don't care what you have this evening, a ten will come, you will not be able to keep it. With Jesus as our Savior, however, we will have that which we cannot lose. And we have to make a decision. Jesus has already said, I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again to receive you unto myself. You notice he is not handing you over to a cherub or archangel. He said, I am receiving you unto myself. That where I am, there you will be also. Takes the sting out of death, takes the fear out of death. Because we're going to go through the valley. Yes, brothers, sisters, we're going to go there. It's the root because the sentence of death has been passed on all men. But I'm glad that Jesus has boldly proclaimed, I am the resurrection and the life. So may you be challenged, and as you walk out this room, to join the Ford family as they lay to rest one of their own. Remember to be to one day we'll have our time when we will face what Valerie has faced. And let us make sure that we use our time while we are here for our advantage. It is what we have learned after we knew it all that really counts. The word of the Lord. Now we had a tribute, and this tribute is coming at this time, so we're asking the one doing the tribute, come forward and do the tribute. Now we have a request from the family, and we're going to invite the two ushers we have designated. We have, from the, our church, we have our sister Rosalind Campbell, and we have Magna, who is out of the Ford family. The two of these will receive from you the offering. And we're asking you to give us a quiet offering. I sure you understand what I said. Not only like what you're doing now, we're asking you to give us a quiet offering. Now we have coming from the panis. They have they have it over there. The two words are coming. Yes. All right. On one side will be Sister Campbell, and the other side will be Magna. And they are coming one side here, one side there. And we receive the guests. Now let's all stand. Let's stand quickly before the panis starts. Father, we give you thanks. You are the giver of life. And after life, you receive us into your glory. You have taught us because you was the greatest giver to give. For in so doing, we are exercising the attribute of our creator. Bless our gifts as they are received. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. And all the people say amen. We will now entertain David Zizi Walcott, who will play for us on the pan. And we will invite him to play on until we have already taken the offering. All right.
this time we'll have prayed, prayers said for the family. And so while we are standing, let's remain doing so as we offer a word of prayer for the strength and the encouragement of these who will have to carry on in the absence of Valerie. Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you they may know the consolation of your love. Give them, our Father, courage and faith who are now bereaved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and asserting hope, and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those whom they love. Encourage them, make them one in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the blessed Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me say thank you to the one who played the pan and for the organist who ably served us in the capacity that he did this evening. And we will say to you, as we make the readiness for the recession, you will allow the Paul Bears and the members of the family to exit this chapel. So we ask you not to step into the aisle. Allow those who will be carrying out their final duties to do so unhindered. We have a song, How Great Thou Art. And it's during the scene of this song, when we reach that stanza, the last stanza, I would like to see all the pallbearers standing by the casket as we lead this recession to the graveyard. Our final hymn.
Let's have your undivided attention as we proceed with the litany. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, Happy are the dead who die in the faith of Christ. Henceforth, says the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, for they take with them the record of their deeds. Man born of a woman has but a short time to live. Like a flower he blossoms, and then withers, like a shadow he flees and never stays. In the midst of life we are in death. To whom can we turn for help but to you, O Lord, who are justly angered by our sins? Lord God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, holy and most merciful Father, deliver us from the bitter pains of eternal death. You know the secrets of our hearts. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins, and at our last hour, let us not fall away from you. Ensure uncertain hope of resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. We commend to Almighty God our sister, Valerie, and we commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we beseech you in your infinite goodness to cover and give grace to those who live in your dear love and die in your favor, that when your beloved son shall come again in judgment, both this our sister and we ourselves may be found acceptable in your sight. Grant this for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We will ask those who are planting their flowers, but they so do after the covering is made, and please remember that the songs are pre-recorded, so we don't want you to raise them. They will be raised on the system. The songs are already pre-recorded, so they will be raised on the system.
Let us turn to the leaflet you have. And the first song we have on our leaflet, pre recorded in the suite by and by.
Join us in our second hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, When Peace Like a River Attendeth My Way.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. O oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Blessed assurance. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the save of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there.
some glad morning when this life is o'er i'll fly away to a home on god's celestial shore i'll fly away Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to Precious Lord, and lead me home. When my way grows dear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry.
precious Lord, take my Thank you.